and welcome to this edition of Berkshire Matters. I'm Bob Dean, I'm your host for today's show. Today we're gonna to be talking with the Elizabeth Freeman Center. Our guests today are Janice Broderick, the Executive Director, and Susan Burns, who's a board member. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, hi Bob. Hi, good to see you guys as always. Um, so I, I wanna ask you first, Janice, about um, basic services. But before I do, do that, I just wanna say that I was looking at your website and I think it's so important what you have there, um, the statement that we all deserve to be safe wherever we go, however we look, whoever we are. I think you know that says it all. And um, I think that's just such an important thing for all of us to just, to just think about and, and, and to appreciate and to value. But anyway, let's go on to the Elizabeth Freeman Center. Um, tell us, Janice, what, what do you do? Who do you serve? And uh, how do you serve people? So I want to let everyone know that um, since COVID hit, we never closed our doors. So we are open. We are ready to help. Um, and people can get in touch with us a number of ways. We have offices in Pittsfield, North Adams, and Great Barrington. Um, and we have a 24-7 hotline that's answered all the time. And people can reach it by um, calling our office numbers in Pittsfield, it's 499-2425, um, or our toll-free hotline, 1-866-401-2425. You can also find it on our website, on our Facebook, um, on our Instagram. So we provide a whole continuum of services. We have the hotline, we can deal with emergencies right away. Um, we can provide support right away. Um, through our offices, we provide counseling and advocacy, and that includes economic advocacy on housing, utility, and, and income issues. Um, we have people who work in the courts to help folks with protection orders. Um, we have um, specialized services for certain populations, including immigrants. We have a counselor with um, immigration expertise. Uh, for LGBTQ folks, for um, children who have witnessed violence, and for uh, survivors who are homeless or housing and stable. Um, we have a special financial independence program called Money School, where we help people like kind of get control over their um, finances, build plans for the future. We help people get back into school. We find scholarships for folks. Um, we help people kind of over the bumps. We it, It's kind of developed as a workshop series, but then we provide ongoing support. So we'll stick with people until, you know, they don't want us anymore. Um, we have supervised visitation um, for high risk cases. We do a lot of community education and outreach. And we also have a youth educator group that goes into the schools and, and uh, teaches kids about sex education, healthy relationships, and um, hoping to um, help them kind of respect themselves and respect others. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. We don't tell people what to do. People can mm. call us. Our services are free and confidential. Even if, even if you don't want to give us your name, um, we will talk with you about options. Um, we don't, like I said, we don't tell people what to do, but we'll kind of work with people about what they want, what might be available to help them get what they want. Um, we will talk to people who are leaving abusive situations or have been assaulted. Um, we'll also work with people who are still in abusive relationships or have concerns about um, their relationships. So we kind of do it on a whole continuum. And with COVID, we are finding that more and more we're talking with people who are kind of trapped in abusive relationships, not knowing how to get out because resources are very Restricted now and limited, right? We'll help people get online and, and uh, apply for benefits. We'll help people develop safety plans. Um, and and we've been doing a lot of planning for safe exits at this point. We have shelter, we have a, a temporary shelter. Um, when our shelter is full, 
Um, we can help people with basic needs like foods, new locks on their doors to keep people safe. Um, just, you know, we try to stay nimble and address people's circumstances individually because although everyone is, you know, kind of is suffering through kind of the same dynamics, everyone's needs and wants are, are very different. So that's kind of a brief overview of our services. <laughs> and and you, you guys you guys do so much. A couple of things I, I just want to reinforce is that you serve male as well as female individuals. Um, I actually had somebody call me a week or so ago um, just wanting to help a friend. And I said, well, he could call the Elizabeth Freeman Center. And they said, well, do they, they serve men? I said, absolutely. Um, and also you, what you had talked about, Janice, the, the, the non-judgmental approach that you have, that somebody can call and get information and you will help them with, um, what, what do you call it, a safety plan if someone needs to leave, you'll help them with all this stuff, but it's up to them to decide what they want to do. Um, and you you guys are going to support them no matter what decision they make, because again, as you said, every, it's all individualized and it, it it can change and people need to make their own their own decision right i mean you know we're not looking to replace the control of the abuser at all right that's mm, what people yeah. have been living with and people know their circumstances the best people know what they want the best um so yeah it's not it's not up to us to tell people what to do yeah. Um, and a lot of times people will come to us and go away, maybe come back, go away. And that's okay. You know, we just want to mm -hmm. be here um, when you when you want us or yeah. need us. And, and also that you will be there with them each step of the way, um, no matter what they decide. You know, the idea that you're not going to just help them when they, they, they decide they may need to leave a situation. You're going to be there after they leave and you're, as you said, until they no longer want you there, but you're helping them with all those important things of, you know, developing um, maybe job skills, um, yeah. maybe up pursue educational opportunities, housing, all of those things that can be so intimidating. Um, but you guys are there to help them each step of the way. Right. I mean, economic circumstances are a big challenge for people who mm -hmm. are yeah. negotiating either an abusive situation or leaving an abusive situation. I mean, 74% of survivors report that they stay with an abuser longer or return to an abusive situation because they can't feed and shelter their kids and themselves. And that's sad. You shouldn't have yes, to choose yeah. between being safe and healthy and um, going hungry. So we have resources to help people get over those bumps and then to develop long-term plans to, to really rebuild. Yeah, and that, that, that's wonderful. You guys do great work. You, 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 you really do. And I, I, I'm, I hope people will, will, give you, will give you a call if they have any questions about any of the things that we're talking about or even things we haven't talked about. Right. So Susan, I'm oh, sorry, Janice, go ahead. I was just going to, yes call you know mm -hmm. if you have any concerns call if you have concerns about a friend or a family member call um and we can provide information and that one 401 2425 number will be coming up on the screen um during the show it'll be scrolling across the screen screen so susan you're you're a board member with uh the freeman center and I understand you're also involved in uh april is sexual abuse awareness month so Tell us about how you came to be a board member, if you could, and then tell us about April um, and Sexual Abuse Awareness Month, please. Oh, boy. Um, I guess, truthfully, when I first moved to the Berkshires, I worked for a wonderful agency that exists no longer called the Massachusetts Office for Children. It was an advocacy organization, and I was a... Um, community organizer around children's issues. And one of the issues was abuse and neglect, both of children and their custodial parents who were almost always their moms. And so I started really learning about the issues facing um, abuse survivors from the perspective of children and then their parents. And worked on Take Back the Night, was an activist, was on the first commission on Berkshire Women, and I've been on the board. And then 
Uh, when I went back to graduate school, I actually did my research on battered women and what enabled or forced them to leave their abusers when they did and to stay out. And then for the second part of my professional life, I was a faculty member and chairperson of the social department at MCLA and I taught a class on um, family violence. And um, so all of those things made me care deeply about the Elizabeth Freeman Center for decades. And I've been on the board for about 12 years. I'm chairperson wow. of the Community Engagement Committee. And that's how I came to be involved really in Sexual Assault Awareness Month, which is the month of April in the United States. And in large part because of that, there is an intern this this year our focus is on street harassment and there is actually an international anti-street harassment movement and this week starting yesterday was the beginning of international anti-street harassment week around the world hmm. and so what we're doing here i'm also on the Berkshire Domestic and Sexual Violence Task Force. And last year, the task force organized Berkshire County's first community-wide read, One Book, One Community. And last year, it was a book about domestic violence, No Visible Bruises. This year, we're connecting the community read to Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And the book is called Stop Telling Women to Smile stories of street harassment and how we're taking back our power. And so we have three different um, prongs to our approach this year. We start out with what's going on right now. We have about 20 book clubs around the county that are reading the same book, Stop Telling Women to Smile, and meeting in small groups to discuss it. We've had I think seven or eight have met already. We've got six or seven meeting this week and another six or seven meeting next week. Then we also have our author this year is actually originally a visual artist. She's an oil painter who specialized in oil paintings. And she grew up in Oklahoma City where she said there wasn't really a lot of foot traffic, and so she didn't experience a great deal of street harassment until she went to art school in Philadelphia, where it really slapped her in the face how much a daily occurrence it was for most, for many women. Then she moved to Brooklyn, New York, and the harassment continued. And she was just personally tired of it and decided to use her art and her activism to sort of combine them together. And so she developed this project where she interviews women about their experiences with street harassment. And one of the questions is, what would you like to say back to your harasser if you had the opportunity? And based on those interviews, she draws pencil sketches of them and then uses something that they said during the course of the interview, usually in answer to that particular question as a caption for the portrait. And we have printed out about 10 of different portraits that um, she drew and we have them on display. We had them printed as lawn signs and we have them on display around Park Square. They went up on March 31st. They'll be up until um, through April 30th. They went up on the lawn of City Hall in North Adams a few days later. And just this past weekend, they went up at two sites in Great Barrington. One is the intersection of routes 723 and 41, where the hedges that say GB are in Great Barrington, oh. in front of the hedges, there's a median strip, and we've got half a dozen of the signs there, and then again in front of Town Hall downtown. So that's sort of the second prong. And all of this will culminate on April 29th, which is a Thursday, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. We have a webinar with the author. And she will be um, sort of talking us through a slideshow that discusses her work. She has taken her show on the road and has worked internationally in um, France, in Italy, in Mexico, as well as all over the country. So we'll be seeing some of her installations from around the country and around the world. And at the end, there will be a question and answer period. And we're hoping that everybody that reads the book, whether they participated in the group discussions or not, will log into the webinar and 
um, participate in that conversation. It's free, it's open to the public. It will be um, simultaneously interpreted in both um, Spanish and ASL, and there will be closed captions. So that's, that's this year's project around sexual assault awareness month. Street harassment is the catchphrase, but it's really harassment that occurs in public spaces, not just mm -hmm. literally on the street. It happens in public bathrooms. It happens on public means of transportation. It happens in side buildings. One of the things, there are things that it has in common and there are things that differentiate it from other forms of gender-based violence. Like other forms of gender-based violence, this is all about power and control and humiliation. This is not about, you know, I wrote an op-ed that was in the paper this weekend and I said, when is a, I opened it by saying sort of, when is a cat call not just a cat call? And the answer is, Always, it's always more than just a cat call. Cat calls are not signs of appreciation. They are not expressions of men's inability to control their lust. They are part of a spectrum of activities that happen on the street. And they are mostly meant to intimidate, if not harass and um, humiliate, excuse me, humiliate and dominate um, the victims. The, Victims vary in terms of their gender identity and their sexual orientation. It's a lot of women, um, but the rates for other marginalized groups are extremely high, particularly women of color, particularly transgender women um, mm -hmm. experience it at very high rates. And the one thing in common is that despite or yeah, despite, I guess, the gender orientation or sexual orientation of the victim, the perpetrators are almost exclusively men. Um, so the domination, humiliation, and control as sort of the goal of this activity is one of the things it shares with other forms of gender-based violence. Most other gender-based violence, however, and people are often surprised by this, but, um, most of it is perpetrated by people that the victim knows, either friends or family or very often an intimate partner. This form of harassment, pretty much by definition, that is not the case. This is harassment in public spaces by people who the victim doesn't know. And that's, um, it's a salient variable because you really don't, no, if somebody is someone who you've had a relationship with, especially if they've already been violent in the relationship, then you're not, you can be surprised at any specific incident, but that it's happening, it, if it's happened before, it doesn't come as a huge shock, except maybe the first couple of times that it happens over time. But when it's a stranger, you don't, ever know, right, who potentially could launch into a very physically violent attack. And so the cat calls and the wolf whistles and the hey baby or hey mama, it's never just nothing because it, it all the threat of violence sits on top and beneath every one of those remarks. And we've had instances very recently, not um, here in terms of a death, but Sarah Everard's murder in London just last month it was an example of a young woman walking home from a friend's house one night, something I'm sure she did regularly, never got there, was talking to her boyfriend for part of the way and never got home. And within a couple of days, her body was found 30 miles away and um, a police officer has been arrested for kidnapping and murdering her. So you don't ever know where it's going to come from. It isn't ever casual. It isn't ever nothing. So let me ask you this. Um, and we, we talked about this a little bit before the show. So say someone my age who's 60 something and is listening intently to what you've just said and says, yeah, but I'm, I don't mean anything like that. I'm, I'm not gonna hurt anyone. I'm just, I just, I'm just being funny. Um, Tell us what's wrong with that picture. 
So there are a couple of things wrong with it. For one, I'll give you an example of my, from my personal life. You may know that, but the recipient doesn't know mm -hmm. that. I have three younger brothers, one of whom lived in um, the Oakland area for a while, and he's a martial arts expert. And he talked about walking down the street at night and real coming up on a group of women and realizing that as he got closer, they were speeding up. Now he knew that he was safe, that not only would he not hurt them, but if he ever was a witness, he would not be a bystander. He would get involved. He would come mm. to anybody's aid if he saw that happening. But those women don't know that. And there was nothing that he could say. He was, if somebody stopped me on the street and started to tell me how they weren't a threat to me, I, my suspicions would probably rise immediately. Yeah. So the only thing he could do as a concerned person was to slow down and back off, mm. which is what he did regularly, because what you know and what the recipient knows are not the same thing. Yep. The other thing is we have to really question whether it's okay for us to be commenting and narrating sort of somebody else's personal space and their personal presentation. It's not, you know, a lot of the, the messages on these signs are things that say, I'm not out here for your entertainment. I'm, you know, I don't care about mm -hmm. your opinion. I'm not, you know, why should I care if you as a stranger think I'm pretty or you know, none of that, you know, really yeah. matters. And it's all uninvited commentary and one of the things that people in the discussions we've had so far the book is called stop telling women to smile so telling somebody mm -hmm. else to smile might seem like one of the most benign things that somebody can say but there are a lot of implicit assumptions in that and um, i was interviewed on the radio by marjo and slater and marjo went off on a tear a well justified tear about working as a waitress as a server and how often while she was doing that client you know customers would say smile i'd leave you a bigger tip if you you know smiled more and she's thinking i'm working i'm not here to entertain you i'm not here to, you know, to make you happy. That's not my responsibility. It's my responsibility to get you your food on time, to not slap it on your lap while I'm doing it, to be sure it's what you ordered. And I don't need your running commentary on how I look or what my face is. I mean, why are women, you know, my kid in, in seventh grade, her science teacher, the only thing he could say to me, and she was top of her class in science when I went to back to school night was, she doesn't smile enough. And I'm thinking, I wonder if this man in his entire career has ever said that to the mother of a son, that his critique mm. of her, of that child, is that they don't smile yeah. enough in class. There are a lot of assumptions about sort of what constitutes gender appropriate behavior mm. built, built into all this commentary, and we really need to rethink it. And, yeah, and I guess the other thing that I wanted to ask both of you about is role modeling. And as, you know, p again, people of my generation, we need to be aware that we've got, you know, maybe children, grandchildren, just other people that are paying attention to what we're doing. And I think, Susan, you said it so well that while we may be thinking this isn't, you know, I don't mean anything by this, it, it is not a good thing to do. And, and others who are listening and observing are, are thinking it's okay because they're seeing us doing it and and certainly we don't want to be sending that message to to anyone that it's okay to to diminish anyone else yeah yeah i mean i think you know traditional gender roles of what we think is appropriate behavior for males and females in our culture underlies a lot of our problems with gender based mm -hmm. violence in this society and so that anything we can do to challenge it to interrupt it helps because mm -hmm. while providing services and we in this community can be really proud of Elizabeth Freeman Center and should be really proud a lot of shelters closed their doors during this yeah. <clears throat> pandemic you know locally that never happened we provide high quality services by well trained and caring you know individuals the agencies managed really well um but in the long run what we say 
is that our ultimate goal is social change so that we put ourselves out of business. We don't want to need domestic violence and sexual assault agencies and, you know, that cover every community in this country. We want that not to be necessary in a perfect world. And one of the ways that we have to do that is one kid at a time by, you know, by, as you said, providing different kind of role models and sending different messages that, you know, that real men don't behave that way. Because a lot of it is performance, a lot, especially the street harassment. A lot of it is men performing for other men. You know, look at me, I'm tough. Yeah. But it also presents a challenge, right? I mean, sexual assault in this country is it happens so often, right? And so that's why street harassment, you know, when you discuss street harassment and, and in Berkshire County, a lot of it is like in bars and public places and meeting places, um, maybe not so much on the street, but on the street as well. It's, it's all sexualized, right? And um, you know, women, women, and we're of the same generation. We were taught to be nice. We're supposed to be nice, which is where the smiling comes from. We're supposed to smile when someone does that to us because we're supposed to like feel it's a compliment. Well, it's not a compliment. Right. Yeah. It's always be followed up by something else, and um, it's 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 really so ingrained in the culture that it just happens everywhere, and people don't notice it anymore. Uh, not okay. <laughs> it's been normalized. This is this is normal. I mean, most women, most women in the United States, most women across the world experience it, yeah. and not rarely. And it starts young. I mean, on average, by the time they're fourteen, you know, hit puberty, and all of a sudden you're fair game. And it's just, you know, I didn't like it when I was a child. I didn't like it when I was a young woman. I don't like it now. And I, I have an eight-year-old granddaughter, you know, and it's just like, no, you know, no. And even if I didn't have an eight-year-old granddaughter, no, you know, it's just, it's not acceptable. Yeah. We got about a minute left. I don't know, Janice, if you want to continue with this discussion or you want to um, go back and just tell us um, some reminders of other things that the Freeman Center does. It's this last 60 seconds is all yours. Oh my God. I, you know, I just want to reinforce encouraging people to call um, with any kind of concerns. It can be anonymous. It's confidential. Um, it's a very difficult time now for everyone, but it's certainly more perilous for folks who are suffering, you know, from sexual or domestic violence. And you know, once once we can connect, you know, we can help people get safe communication devices, say, you know, safety plans, help with expenses. Um, so just really do call and you can call any one of our office numbers or a hotline or email us at info at Elizabeth Freeman Center dot org and, and we will respond. So great. Well, thank you, Janice. Thank you, Susan. Um, and uh, um, thank you for everything you do. And to those who are joining us today, we know this information will be very helpful to you or someone you know. Please give the Freeman Center a call. They're here to help. And it's all confidential, non-judgmental. And um, have a great day, everyone, and be well. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.